Assalamualaikum sir. Govind bol si sir. Govind jo bhala thay kumli. Salam sir. Aasi mota moti sir. Apna bhala sunto sir. Hey bhala si Govind aur busy time. today this is our 58th lecture session on ECG study group and we have today two excellent speaker dr s mokaddesh hasan sadi sir and dr mohsin ahmed mohsin ahmed sir before starting the session i'd like to request professor abdul wahid choudhry sir to speak about our speakers today and then we proceed wahid choudhry sir Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everybody. Uh, today, we are going to have a different type of presentation from Shardar Mukaddes Hussain Sadi Bhai. He'll be talking about a little bit about the history of cardiology, its development in this country and uh, in the world as a whole. And Dr. Mohsin, my favorite colleague, uh, we also work together in IPDI. Uh, he'll be presenting a few ECGs we want to hear his input. And today we were discussing among ourselves that he is an organizer who always remain in the back uh, when he did his job in IPDI. But today he's going to be the presenter. And we are going to enjoy how he present, how he see the things in his chamber, in his hospital and elsewhere. Both of them, are academicians. Sadi Bhai, a true Nibrito Chari Manush, Shabai Hutu Chenena, Kintu Uni Kolujinishni, he likes to analyze things very deeply. And Mosin is an activist in mind, in body, in practice everywhere. And he is always active trying to do to improve the academic condition, the academic criteria, and everything regarding cardiology and elsewhere. I have talked a bit much. Let us go together for the presentation and let's enjoy it. Shardar Mukaddesan Chadi Bhai, would you please start your presentation? Course Director, Professor Dr. Abdul Adib Choudhury, Learned Viewers, Assalamu Alaikum, Good Evening and Good Morning. I, Dr. S. Mukaddas Hussain Sadi, welcome all of you to my talk. How and where do we stand in cardiology in 2021? William Harvey, a British physician in 1600. 28 first told heart contacts for circulation and he published at that time at second in 236 Ibn al-Hafiz Ibn al-Nafiz is born in Damascus work in Cairo a forgotten genius discovered pulmonary circulation published at as he worked with coronary and capillary circulation about 400 
years before William Harvey. Since Ibn al Nafis and William Harvey were noticed a series of grand achievements. Among them, 11 are most notable. These great achievements are electrocardiography, cardiac catheter, invasive care unit, cardiovascular drugs, preventive cardiology, echocardiography, pacemakers, and internal defibrillator, cardiac electrophysiology, catheter ablation, and 3D color mapping. Now, let us see and honor those guys who brought this modern cardiology from Al Nafiz and William Harvey. Although William Osler and Austin Flint first wrote physical examination of heart and cardiovascular system, the birth of modern cardiology dated when William Antovan first recorded ECG from a sting galvanometer in a dash town of Leiden. Anthovan himself described Vizemini, actual flutter, filation, ventricular hypertrophy, subsequently with others, ischemia and myocardial infarction. Uh, in 1893, Wilhelm, his junior, a Swiss born German cardiologist, anatomy first discovered his bundle. Desmuk first proposed his bundle pacing, and Huang did long time septal pacing close to his bundle. Cardiac catheterization. Postman first did human cardiac catheterization on himself. Conan and research first measured the pressure from different chambers of hearts, both in normal and congenital heart disease. Once upon a time, surgery were being done by putting the patient in hanging position. Cardiac surgery, Ari Gross first did modern cardiac surgery at Harvard and Boston by closing patent ductus arteriosus. J.S. Given first did open heart surgery by closing atrial septal defect. Pebelero first connect aorta with right coronary artery by saponous vein graft. This was the first saponous vein graft connected by the pebelero. Now see the Uh, surgical and intervention historical timeline. Postman in intervention, postman first started, then Conan, Sons, daughter, Zutkin, Kudunjik. In this way comes the mid cap and surgery, Beck, More, Bailey, then uh, Fabularo, Johnson. In this way, cardiac plagia. Now, coronary angiogram and angioplasty. Sons, the Sons first did coronary angiogram in a Cleveland clinic in 1958. Julian, a registered in cardiology in Royal Infirmary, Edinburgh, Scotland, he first articulated the concept of coronary care unit and thereby reduced the early hospital death half from 30%. His Sisu concept spread in the world like a wildfire. Depending on the depending on the work of Dr. and Zupkin, Grunzi burst in the world in 1977 by doing coronary balloon angioplasty. This was not a labor table, it was the Grunzi kitchen table where PTC balloon born. Grunji actually in daytime he worked in medicine and radiology department and at night he used in the he used to work in the postmortem department and with his wife and other friends used to cut the coronary artery size 
different coronary artery and measured the size and balloon size and thereby he did balloon angioplasty the great man was very unfortunate he did he lost his father in the end of second world war and he died by airplane crash in georgia usa cardiac drugs black first developed beta blocker kushman and odenti first isolated angiotensin converter enzyme inhibitor captopril acura endo first isolated the asmg coreductase inhibitor statin preventive cardiology paul dudley hoyt father of american cardiology pioneered the concept of preventive cardiology nl was associated with great study from him on and identify the risk factor for coronary artery disease like smoking hypertension diabetes hypertrophy building on the electrophysiologist work pm zol a cardiologist in harvard and beth israel hospital first developed pacemaker and internal defibrillator michael mirosky a cardiologist working in sinai hospital baltimore first invented implanted cardiovascular defibrillator icd depending on the principle of detection of submarine helmut hartz and edler first launched the echocardiographic field cardiac electrophysiology non fluoroscopic color map cardiac catheterization ablation rfa it is a young sub specialty of medicine in mid 1970 jejo olens developed clinical electrophysiology in 1996 benham started catheter ablation with 3d color mapping thank you all for witness and hearing adibhai very interesting Hello. very interesting i think i really enjoyed the presentation rafik sir do you want to make a comment please um thank you it's a very nice lecture um i mean what is the importance people will talk about the stories i think these stories are important um the few of the things some of these uh, people uh, described things before like av block was described before electrocardiography electrophysiology was described before electrophysiology started by shamrock and these are the brilliant minds that actually like in the early 1900 people looked at the pulse and the jugular vena tracing and postulated first degree second degree and third degree heart block shamrock actually described electrophysiologic mechanism which was proven after 30 years so these are visionary thinking and i think the reason history is important that the younger group uh, you have to come up with ideas um, and uh, work on it uh, some of this may prove to be benefit uh, come up as uh, successful others will not and that's science thank you thanks today for that good lecture Atapai, do you want to make make a comment, sir, about it? Really impressive, actually. Uh, I like to congratulate uh, Mogadish and Sadhvi for your actually summary about the history and brilliant talk. And uh, really, it is encouraging. Actually, I most of the times we forget to learn about these things, but it is an inspiring lecture and talk by the Sadhvi. Sadhvi, thank you very much and congratulations to you. Thank you also. now i think we can go for the ecg session today we are going to have presentation yes. from dr mohsin ahmed mohsin are you going to start your session and sadhvi bhai again thank you thank you so much
Wasif, can you share your screen? Yes. Yeah, we, we can see it. Uh, thank you. This uh, is the study group. Professor Atari, sir. Professor Abdul Adi Chaudhary. And our uh, respected, uh, our, uh, I think, uh, one of the best guardian of Bangladesh, the Professor Rafiq Amr, sir. I will is the, is the is the real guardian. He always nourishes us, and we are learning a lot from the Professor Rafiq Amr. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, to invite me to the session. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can, can hear you. Yes. 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 Uh, I always listen last two years. I think most of the most popular session in Bangladesh in cardiology sector is the ECG study group. Our, our junior colleagues, also my senior colleagues always discuss about these classes. We learn a lot from this class. I just uh, discussed today some case-based ECG, a collective from the NICBD. Uh, thank my fellows to help me uh, to collect this ECG. And number and one is the 22 years old male is non-smoker. Last 12 hours, uh, he is symptom the palpitation and breathlessness. And he also uh, previous episode of symptoms within two years. On examination, his pulse may be not practicable. His body rate 30 beats per minute. Cyanosis clubbing present. His uh, SpO2 is 83%. And this is 15 by 15. This is, is a short. Uh, I think uh, here is the fellow, also fellow here. They can try to this step by CG. Dr. Nasmul is here. Dr. Nasmul is here. Unmute Nazmul, please. Please. Do you want poll, Mohsin? Uh, all the emphasis on the ECG say that is a regular ECG. There is no PFs, I think so. And white cure is complex. So, our differential diagnosis is. Uh, in the 80 percent case, is a ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia with apparent conduction due to a bundle block, 15 percent, and SBT or WC 55 percent. Professor, uh, any comment from this? Uh, my depression diagnosis. Can you back to uh, your Yeah, I mean, the rate is very fast, but also, I mean, one of the other diagnoses should be sinus tachycardia with right bundle branch block. Yes, it should be yes. a diagnosis. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, uh, the sir, one question that I'll be asking, is it likely that a patient with uh, aberrant conduction is going to have pulse BP not recoverable? Are you asking me or? Yes, sir. I, I'm asking you, sir. Um, let's was it make it. Sir. Professor. Yeah, no, motion won't ask the question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, so, I mean, it, it, let's make an assumption. This is the 80, uh, this is ventricular tachycardia. And a young person with normal LV, I would expect pulse, even in the setting of VT. Um, so with this ECG, if there is no pulse or blood pressure, I have to think of something else going on with this patient. Not only the tachycardia, is there additional thing going on with this patient? Sir, I have a question, Moshin. Yes, sir. Sir, in lead, lead one, lead two, V4, V5, something looks like P before QRS, sir. Moshin? Yes, yes, yes. 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 So, the getting pulse or not pulse, I, I mean, it doesn't really diff, uh, makes a whole lot of difference in terms of EKG diagnosis. 
because it makes your life easy because if it's a white complex tachy and high potential and no pulse, you probably shock. But the question, and you pray that you try and figure out, then you just wait for that hemodynamics. But that alone should not be a differentiating thing between SVT and BT because we can go either way. But in this EKG, the clinical context is very important, I think, because of this patient's clinical presentation. And it looks like to me that the depolarization is very sharp. So it is less likely to be BT in this case. Um, I don't know what's wrong by your comment is because there is a right bundle and there, there is right axis deviation. Patient has uh, probably congenital heart disease, most likely a, a, an, an ASD and uh, uh, probably septum secundum. Can I see the EKG again? We'll see the ECG. Sure. Yeah. And the, if, if we look at lead V5, lead one, to me, it looks like more of a sinus tag yeah. rather than any other uh, differential that a VT or supraventricular tachy with uh, bundle branch block uh, is. Uh, that's what I think. And I don't know the, um, uh, I, I, did, I did not see the hemodynamics. What was okay. the patient hemodynamics at this point? Okay, Hafiz, I'm going to yes. touch, follow up with Hafiz conversation. The Hafiz pointed out something which I don't expect. He's, he's becoming too much for me because he even deflect, described the deflection is sharp origin of the QRS complex. It's a very <laughs> important point. Yes. But if you look at lead V1, that is small r, there is a second big r. That's number one. Number two, if you look at V5, V6, the ratio between r and s is not less than one. In V6, it, at best, it is one. Those two factors goes against ventricular tachycardia. Yes. So the whole, but the other point that important point half is made, irrespective, we have to make a ECG diagnosis without regard to the blood pressure and palpable pulse or not. That's a different story. So, and if you look at the QRS complexes, there is something before the at the end of the T wave, before the QRS, and it's consistent. Actually, it's very good ECG because you can see it in lead one, in lead two, lead three, um, AVR, AVL, um, and V1 through V6. Um, so I think it is most likely sinus tachycardia with bundle bunch block rather than anything else. <coughs> sir, can, I make a sir, sir, can I make a comment, sir? Yes. That's why I'm asking. Yes, Sometimes yes. people think if I don't have pulse and BP, it must be VT, but it should not be. Yeah. Sir, can we put sir, atrial flutter as a differential diagnosis sir, because of the... Rate uh, is very high. 180. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, these are all, we have to keep all this mind. So if it is atrial flutter, if it is one-to-one -one flutter, it's a very slow flutter. Mm. If it is two to one flutter, it's too fast for a flutter, for a flutter. So uh, I think it's a discrete P wave, um, oh. whether it's atrial tachycardia or sinus tachycardia, that's the question of uh, semantics and uh, we need better ECG. Okay, let's continue. But whatever so, it is, so the, patient, the clinical patient. condition is driving the patient nuts because of the tachycardia and then uh, clubbing and sinus is both. Uh, is a very good clue that this is going to be a complex congenital. So, uh, sir, uh, how do you manage the patients? Because this is, is, is short and is a sinus tachycardia they have in conductions. So, how do you manage the patients? Sir? Oh, so the management, can I talk about it? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. I'm not going to shock this person. Yeah. First of all, uh, yes. the best thing I'll do, I'll get an echo machine to get. Of course, fluids, um, whatever support we can give to maintain him, but I'll get an echo very quickly. And Hafiz may have a comment on that. <laughs> sir, uh, Hafiz, bhai, before that, uh, Sari is saying, because the GCS is 15 over 50, so there are enough circulation in the brain that the patient is uh, quite okay cerebrally. So that's the yeah. point. We should think a little bit more before uh, giving a shock or anything like that. 
So I, I, I think it is also important to examine the patient. Can I go yeah. back in any murmur, anything? Because this is uh, working diagnosis is sinus tachycardia with underlying cardiac complex, a congenital complex, and I'll go one by one, but there is any fever and any, uh, any um, other auscultatory finding and lung finding. Uh, Mosin, Mosin, can you describe that? So uh, it is the it is a regular white tumor area, maybe sinus area, but patient is symptomatically unstable. So our fellows uh, uh, in the hospital they did the synchronized cardioversion. So uh, this patient is Russell, twenty years old. After cardioversion, uh, we find there is a uh, tall P wave. It is the it is the five millimeter size more than five millimeters of wave. So after calibration, you see uh, there is a P wave is the tall P wave. So the P wave is like, uh, uh, if you look at the V1, the biatrial enlargement, but yes, sure. there is a right atrium is also very big and yes. there is a right bundle and then right axis. Yes. So, uh, and then, so, if you look, show me this, this is usually consistent with ASD, uh, yes, but yes. It, there may be more into this because the clinical picture does not fit you in with only ASD. There is something more going and on. There's also right axis deviation. Yes. Correct. So, so right uh, bundle, right axis, secondum, but so there may be more into this. There okay. is Can you go back or, to the first TCG? Yes. Good. Let's go, go back. See? So if you look at, clearly there is P wave and you can compare with the post conversion, but look at the P wave now. If you look at lead two, it looks like there is a negative positive. So possibly this was an atrial tachycardia um, that was happening. Because if you look at lead two, there is the initial negative followed by a positive component. So it's a supraventricular mechanism and the QRS complex actually post-conversion did not change much compared to pre-conversion. And of course, the Himalayan P wave is now evident. So this is an interesting case. So and the, why and the life was easy because the patient was hypotensive. Yes. So the shock. So, so our, uh, uh, it is the Himalayan P. It is tall P for the five millimeter. For the, for the fellows, I just uh, lead two, three ABF. Most people will lead two. Most common case is the, we know, abstain anomaly. Tachyspeed atresia combined with tachyspeed and pulmonary stenosis. In, uh, a mechanism with the prolonged contraction of the electrical impulse toward the enlarged right atrium, thus resulted in tall and broad P. Uh, the causes the tall P up through the inhibited right TL pressure and the development of a large compound right atrium. Other, other yeah. some few, few cases. Motion, like can, I, big... can I interrupt yes. you for a second? Yes, yeah, sure, sir. Sure. Was the patient awake? Yes, sir. Was the patient awake or was the patient unconscious? Uh, patient, uh, patient is the CS is 15 by 15. Patient is uh, awake, yes. So when the patient came, the patient was awake, right? Yes, 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 sure, sir. So if the patient is awake, that is not compatible with, um, with a, a pulse uh, blood pressure not available, right? Yes. So because the patient is there. So, I mean, we, you shock the person, I, it's a perfect thing to do, but the question would be, if it was pericardial tamponade, Hafiz, do you think that we need to rule out that when the patient yes, sure, sure. Yeah. But but anyway, it's, it's very interesting. In, in our, in your uh, setting, uh, all the is, fellows are on the, when, when there is the, uh, they did the they did DC shot, but uh, as Rovix has said, we should uh, follow the some these things because some equation in the CCU should do the issue eco echocardiography as uh, Dr. Hafiz also asked for. Uh, what is that? Please comment, uh, do the DC shot in this case. Yes. One of the things that goes against sinus tech is to be sinus tech of 180 is a very, 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 very,
Yes. How many sinus tech have we seen at 180, 151? So that goes against sinus tech. I think this is a very good case. All right, go ahead, please. Well, well the thing is that sinus tech possibly is a young guy, but my issue is that the pulseless VT, you know, the you you see the patient uncon loses consciousness. So this is not pulseless VT. Yeah. And if we cannot yes. feel the pulse, but patient maintenance is good, maybe the pulse is feeble but something is there because the patient is conscious. So in that situation, if you want to do cardioversion, you just give the uh, sedatives and, and, then, and, and then give the uh, cardioversion, or you wait and pray that the patient loses consciousness, then you don't need any sedative. <laughs> yeah, this is... <laughs> because we cannot shock a conscious patient, that's for, that's for sure because it is very, uh, not very pleasant to the patient. So we did the ECG, uh, echocardiography, there's the RB, this one, RB related, and so, uh, it's the echocardiography. Ah, uh, big, big, yeah. Very big, F generally. Also, there is a ASD also. So F generally, up to the and acute septal defect, second term, as Professor Hazib Hafiz has already told, and moderate pulmonary hypertension, good LB6 function, but impaired RB6 function. Uh, so uh, another case, uh, 55 uh, years uh, old. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mosin, please go yes. back yes. a little bit. Uh, diagnosis. Eh? Yes. The thing is, Hafiz Bhai uh, uh, rightly pointed out, the patient is cyanose and also has clappy. You can get sinuses in an acute case, but you do not get clubbing. And that's the truth that that patient must have complex congenital heart disease. Yes, sure. That's the way of a logical thinking. And the bright mind of Habib Bhai has truly pointed it out nicely. One of the important thing that when you look at the echo, everybody should know that sometimes we have a tendency to overcall. In this case, I definitely think this is uh, there's, it is no brainer. It's a very florid case of uh, abstains. But look at the tricuspid origin because mitral versus tricuspid. Huge, the, huge the, difference. Look at the, this, the location of the tricuspid valve, way down. Um, so, uh, and then fully atrialization of the, um, of the uh, uh, ventricle and giving this appearance, you know. Um, Question is why there is cyanosis? Any uh, the the um, and then and then another important question will come up: if there is cyanosis, what will you do to manage this patient? The patient has moderate pulmonary hypertension. That should be accounted for. That should be taken into account. That the patient needs against surgical intervention. Yes. Yeah. And next, next case, I go low. So, uh, next case, sir. Yeah, please, please. Okay, uh, uh, some, 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 more, some more most cases there, sir. That Interesting case. What about this second dump closer? Because this is a case you don't want to close <laughs> because this can <laughs> be deteriorating. <laughs> so uh, my second case, uh, 55 years old male, he also hypertensive diabetic and known cause of coronary disease. He, he had history of PCI 10 years back and coming in our hospital with the chest pain and witness uh, for four hours. On examination, pulse may be not recordable. And uh, there is a speed rate 30, lung base repetition, and also oxygen is 85, GCS 30 by 15, and CBC in 80 million. Uh, is the ECG? And any comment of this? I think uh, it is regular. It is 230 bps a minute. PF is present. PF is, is 20 to 40 milliseconds and positive confidence and AV decision. Uh, Athar, sir, any comments regarding my findings? Before Athar says anything, I tell you one thing. If yes, the sure. EKG looks like pulse oximetry, this is VT. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> <laughs>
we did that. Are you Russian? No, uh, can, can you, can you uh, go sir, back, sir, please? Sir, professor, sir. So, Hafiz always talks me about imagination. <laughs> but, no, but it's important. We have to imagine, but we also have to imag justify our imagination. Correct. So the question is, how do you tell there is a big association from this ECG? It's important to understand that. I mean, no question, our first diagnosis looking at this ECG is VT. But then if I add this factor that there is a big dissociation, where is the big dissociation? That we have to justify. If you look at lead AVR, there is a long strip. There is a notch immediately after the QRS, but it's too far away from the P, uh, v, v. So it may be part of the QRS complex or maybe a retrograde peak, one or the other. Second issue is the concordance. So how do you define concordance? So let's start with this chest lead. And if I draw a line, in the front of it, in, when I come to lead V1, it becomes very difficult for me to say which part is positive, which part is negative. So that's why to use the term concordance, we have to, if, if all of them look like V3, V4, V6, V5, V6, I would have agreed with you about the concordance part, but my problem is I cannot use that really in that context. But the clinical diagnosis, ECG diagnosis, unless everybody, I, I, I'm making out these points just to create a controversy which normally Hafiz does. But, uh, <laughs> but by, are you saying this is a VA conduction or is it a complete No, no, no. I am not saying that I cannot say there is a V. I, I'm saying this is VT. But right. I, I'm finding it very difficult to use the term evidence association in this case. It, it looks because like VA conduction, sir. Unless, 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 no, but then VA conduction, if, it, if you call it VA conduction, how do you know this is not part of the QRS complex that's yeah. looking like right. that? Yes. Right. Right? Right. So right. all these things, why am I bringing up all the, all these things must simultaneously work in our brain and come with a final conclusion. So, so thank you. Sir. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yeah. In this ECG, in which lead will calculate the R to S interval, sir? <laughs> you can you cannot because you see, I have to draw it. So this look at this scenario. We can sit in this ECG and I can draw a line and I can try to find it, but the patient is in front of you without a pulse. You don't have time for that. Yeah. Right. So you have to make the diagnosis at that point with this diagnosis. And of course, diagnosis, but motion came. So motion, please continue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But uh, we all agree this is a sustained monomorphic VT. No question about it. No question. Yes, sure, sure. So did the cardio version? After DC shock, uh, I think uh, there is a whole inferior mind and also she shows the ST depression. ROA V1 V2 V3 and ST depression is the V1 V3. So it is the regular part of the area VT, liver to sinus syndrome, suspected acute true posterior amine and only inferior amine. This is a posterior ECG. And we see the ST depression in the V7 to V9. Yeah. After ST care, there is a posterior ECG. Is I still go, it's normal coming back. It's the nicely finding. To your mind, no, it is the always neglected part. We should concern about it. 15 to 20 percent STMI contest inferior mileter infection. Isolated posterior is less common, 5 percent. Diagnosis often missed. Early addition is crucial for therapeutic purpose. Um, uh, did you sorry? do a cast sorry. of this patient or sorry. did you do a cardiac cast? Angiogram? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know, sir, because uh, 
this patient is discharged and I don't know oh, what is not okay. sure, not, sure. Not the patient. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, for the audience, a young audience, yes, remember yes. that this is one situation where even in absence of ST depression in atrial uh, ST elevation in atrial DCG, you have to think about using the thrombolytics. Primary PCI, you can always go for that, but using thrombolytics, you have to look at the ECG and you have to think about posterior MI and do the posterior leads. Okay, Motion, can you go back to the first ECG again? I'm, yes, I'm sorry, I'm going sure. back into this. Yeah, sure, sir, sure, sir. So my question to the audience will be that what is that will be that, let's say I give this ECG and the patient is a 25 year old person with pulse and blood pressure. You also have to keep in mind uh, now, uh, WPW syndrome with uh, orthodromic tachycardia. That, that you have to remember in mind. Um, of course, in this case, it's a differential. So the clinical context, that will be one of the differential diagnoses of this white QRS tachycardia, even though this was not the case. Thank you. Sir, so, uh, sir in this ECG, can, uh, can I ask a question, sir? Sorry, yeah. Sir. Yeah. Sir, if we take the lead AVR, where there yes. is a different some hump following QRS. Yes. So is it possible to retrograde conduct QRS in that much high, higher rate? Oh, oh, of course. This is not too high. I mean, 230, if somebody is very sick, every conduction can improve. I mean, it is possible, theoretically possible. I mean, I have seen a AVNRT with a rate of 220 in an 80-year-old person. So think about the AV conduction. So that is not impossible. It is unlikely. What you are saying, it, it, yes, it is unlikely to see that kind of one-to-one -one conduction, but it is possible, yes. Another interesting thing in this case, which is that the it is a sustained monomorphic VT. In the case of acute MI, that is not the usual rhythm, either VFIP or polymorphic VT. So, the question is, what is it that because sustained monomorphic will be some scar related VT, but is it possible that there is an old inferior and a scar, but the new um, MI also uh, posterior MI is possible? A little, little um, puzzling to me that that is not the usual case, uh, the way patient presents. So, yes, exactly, exactly, sir. Because only posterior my kidney is so so morbid condition of the patients. So yeah. How would you explain that, this? Sir? No, uh, I, I definitely will entertain the diagnosis of posterior. How you cannot? Yes, but yes. the question is the VT is little puzzling to me that the yes. way it was a sustained monomorphic VT. But uh, and if there is a time, I will show you that this thing that we always talk about in cardiology, the sustained monomorphic VT means scar and polymorphic is usually ischemic. There is a considerable overlap on both sides. That means that polymorphic can be not related to ischemia and then monomorphic can be in the setting of MI. Okay, good, thank you. Next case, sir, uh, 40 years old male, uh, not known to hypertension diabetic, we are not known. Palpitation for three days. You are on exhibition pulse 130, blood pressure 100 by 70. The spirit is normal, lung clear. The spirit is normal. Uh, it is fine. Uh, it is ECG showed. I think anyone can. Uh, Dr. Nazmul is here. Or so, Pushar, Dr. Mosin, Dr. Pushar, I Dr. think Pushar. we need to. I'm sorry to, uh, to, to jump in because I'm just getting my thoughts together. So that has huge implication. I don't know, Rafik, by what will be a comment because we, we had a couple of cases like this where there is sustained monomorphic VT, but you open the infarcted artery, but the LV in that area is dyskinetic. And then are you comfortable to send these patients without ICD? Because if you think that the VT is that, then it is a secondary prevention. And in that case, the ICD is indicated. So it cannot be that simple that it is a posterior MI, you revascularize and then send home because the substrate for the VT may be different. And why that happened, 
maybe on the top of peri infarct area, there is a dispersion in the depolarization and that triggered the VT, but maybe it is not like the primary VF where you just open the artery and then VF, you don't need to worry about the ICD in that setting. You know what I'm saying? It can be a little complicated. And that patient's echo is very crucial to study that what happened, he, and I know that patient did not probably agree for cap, but I would cap the patient and get a mo much more information to make a decision because he may encounter another sustained VT and, and may die. Sir, hey, sir without, uh, without structural uh, assessment, can we go for that uh, ICD? <laughs> Profit by. Because the scar, without okay. knowing the scar, can we go for that? Okay, so two things. First of all, if it is VF, you can explain just by ischemia. When there is VT, there is a substrate, number one. Number two, when I need to fix the substrate first. So if I'm going to spend five to 10 lakh taka on a patient, the primary thing, I, I mean, it is extremely, extremely rare that I will agree to putting an ICD on somebody who refuses to have cardiac catheterization or intervention done. Because I, that is going to determine long-term survival of the patient, not the defibrillator. So, um, I mean, it's as simple as that. If somebody doesn't want a cath or, um, and he needs a cath, uh, I, I, we will just be reluctant to put ICD in this kind of patient. That's why I love you, Rubik Bhai. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. We can proceed now, sir. Uh, this yeah. is ACG, another uh, person, a stable patient. Oh, let's get somebody from the audience to talk about this ECG. Any, any audience here? Uh, anybody can talk? Can somebody raise their hand? Would somebody raise their, their hand? Uh, Ribu, you can add someone, somebody. Uh, sir, Dr. Muti Rahman has raised his hand. Okay, okay. Uh, two participants uh, also another two person. Please add, Professor please add M. G. Azum, sir, has raised his hand. Okay. No, not Professor Adam, the other person. Okay, sir. I'm uh, Moti Dr. Rama. Moti Rahman. I have given him the permission to talk. And Dr. Abdullah Al Mamun also. Mamun? Yes, Abdullah Al Mamun is uh, unmuted now. Yes, hmm. uh, Dr. Abdullah Al Mamun, please speak up. Hello, Assalamualaikum, sir. Yes, Mamun, describe this, please. Uh, this is a 12 ray surface ECG with normal standardization and calibration, uh, calibration showing. The rhythm is irregular and there is a P, a P is absent. And <laughs> rhythm is irregular, P is absent. Their um, QR is duration is uh, narrow. And there is a uh, there is a left uh, ex, uh, axis is normal, uh, looks like uh, axis is left axis deviation. And the most uh, prominent findings are there is, uh, um, there is um, LVH, um, it seems to be like LVH because uh, as, as in B1 and RNB6, uh, more than 35, uh, 35 millimeter. And there is a deep symmetrical T, deep, uh, deep, Deep uh, the inverted TOF in B5 and B, uh, involving uh, three cordialis B2 and B6. So, my uh, impression is this is a K ECG diagnosis is um, F with fast ventricular rate with LB with a strain. Good, excellent. Motion, any comment? Please continue. It is irregular and also heart rate is more. And also LBC state is right. Expiration sir, and, sir, yeah. sir, can I make a comment, sir? Yes, yes. Sir, we did sir, go. In ECG, if you look at LUT2, sir, uh, can you go back to ECG? Sure, sure. Yes, sir. May I comment? May I comment to further more? Absolutely. Oh, wow. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. And there is, um, if we look uh, at the, the two, three, uh, two, lead uh, two, uh, lead 
at uh, V1 and FVR, uh, there is the uh, there is TOM inversion in the two and FVL, but uh, T uh, T is upright in FVR, and this is a um, uh, this is called a triad uh, that is Anis uh, triad. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it is specific for the uh, ACM patient. Tushar was saying something. Yeah. So sure. uh, need to the first complex in the QRS. Before QRS, there is a small p. Yes, so I I, I also uh, lead to some p. Uh, professor, there is, there is there a p is in the lead two. The first yes. complex. Yes, first complex. Yes. But, okay. But that does not look uh, normal p. But morphologically, look does not look more uh, normal p, yes. sir. Sir, it is upright P, sir. Though small, but upright P, sir. Okay, fine. I agree with that. But so look at lead V1. After the word V1, there is a QRS, and there is before next, there are two tiny waves. So these are the ones that is basically atrial flutter fibrillation complexes. Sometimes in some leads, they can look like P wave. And that's the way. I mean, if you look at the fourth complex in lead V, looks almost like a P wave. But it is not, it's just the way ECG is. So it's basically, it's, it is, this is clear, actual fibrillation. Whether you, it is some form of macro reentry flutter with a very fast rate, that's a debatable question. But by all means, I think 90% of physicians will accept this is the diagnosis of actual fibrillation with left ventricular hypertrophy. Yes, um, sir. As a motion, actually, uh, back to ECG, please. Sure, sir. First of all, thanks to Dr. Abdullah Ramam for nicely describing this ECG. Abdullah Ramam, thank you very much. Motion, can you clear the two terms? Actually, sir, in atrial fibrillation, there is a common popular term, atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate and atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular rate. Can you define these two terms, motion, please? Usually, usually we... Uh... So you can easily uh, pass particular rate is the, the particular rate is a uh, uh, rate is the more than usually 120 100 120 more than is the pass particular rate and usually less than 100 is only the low, slow particular rate sir rubik sir well you have to follow the sinus rhythm and sinus tachycardia rate yes if sinus rhythm we normally consider between 60 to 100 so if within between 60 to 100, no comment. It's actual fibrillation with control response. Anything over 100, rapid ventricular response. Anything less than 60, slow ventricular response. I mean, that's the standard. I don't think there is any hard fast in this. Uh, can I make a comment, sir? Yeah. For the uh, students here, in the OSP exam, what we wanted from you in, in such a case, we wanted the rate is more than 100 or the rate is less than 60. You don't have to put the exact rate in the case of atrial fibrillation in these cases. We wa just want to hear from you the rate is, whether it is control rate or it is uh, fast ventricular response or sl uh, slow ventricular response. For the exam purpose. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, continue, please. So it is simple, like, uh, the You see, there is a SAM, sitting to measure of the anterior metal leaflet. So there is a gradient also, 57 millimeter mercury. So the diagnosis- uh, Sorry, Mosin, Dr. Mosin, before you show the EKG uh, echo, there is more in that EKG other than the rhythm. And I think it is important to highlight those because yes. there is LVH and there yes. is asymmetric T inversion and the very ugly looking uh, T inversions. And, and as a rule, I tell this, the uglier the T inversion, the less likely is ischemia. And in this case, if the LVH without any afterload increase, then it raises the question of intrinsic myopathies, right? If there is no afterload, that means patient has no aortic valve stenosis in the adult and no hypertension, then the LVH has to be explained by some other cause and one of those will be the familial hypertrophic versus uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathies. This is important right from the get-go to understand that from that EKG, a lot of information can be uh, 
consider. Uh, Dr. Moshe, can you go back, please? Sure, sir. So let's make an assumption that I'm just new to cardiology. Can you go back? Please go back one more. Yeah, please. No, no, next one. Now the echo, echo, please, echo. Echo, sir, echo, yes, sir. Yes, please. Explain this ECG to me, assuming I don't know anything about echo. If, if just, there must be some audio people who don't understand what, what you are talking about, the septum and the posterior wall. If you could just point, do you have a pointer? Yeah. This one, this one? Yes, please explain what you, what you are seeing. It is the, is the septal wall, is the anterior wall, and the posterior wall. You see that there is, a, uh, is the anterior wall is the, you saw? Uh, 24 and posterior is the 15. 24.8 okay. millimeter is the IV septal wall and uh, in the posterior is the 15. There is so there is asymmetrical. This also there is a you see the preemptive motion of the metal leaflet. So there is the obstruction also obstruction. Asymmetrical septal to be with obstruction this big finding. Okay. Sure. Yes. Thank you. And Ravi Bhai, for you I tell you another thing. Simple. Also also the like, guardian wall. also. 57. Uh, this, sir, uh, 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 when there is hugging the wall, there are only probably two differential. One is that patient is hypovolumic and hyperdynamic LV and trying to squeeze the last drop of volume from the LV. Hugging the wall is very interesting in cardiology because that is hypovolumia, hyperdynamic, or there is cardiomyopathy familial or infiltrative cardiomyopathy when there is clearly you see there is a hugging the wall and not only that there is early indication looks like some SAM also. Um, so this is very interesting echo. Okay. Can you Thank explain please the hugging the wall please in this figure? That means both walls are touching each other. <laughs> Almost. So when you Almost. see that in the port chamber and, and then you need to think about this. In the absence of LVH, Hypovolumia, sometimes we see that, you know. And in dialysis patient, you can have LVH and hypovolumia in a dialysis patient. That is really interesting. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, by, uh, how will you manage the patients in your hospital? No, you, you go ahead, Dr. Morrison. You tell me what you, you think, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah. There's AF is commonly observed in patients with HCM, maybe less than 22%. So incidence is three percent, systemic amyloidism six percent. So we should consider about the anticoagulations. We also think about the surface score. We should there may be vitamin K dependent anticoagulants or drug can be used. So uh, in our context in Bangladesh, so we usually deserted to manage this patient. So Dr. Hafiz, uh, how no. do you manage the patient in the? No, no, in no, the please. I have a question. Yes, sure, sure. What is sure, the sure. role of Chad's fast code in this patient? Uh, we should we should think about the score because uh, we use the because there is some bidding risk in the anticoagulations. So, no, we should, so uh, okay, uh, yeah, because uh, what is the Chad's fast score of this patient? I think uh, this patient's uh, age is. Uh, <laughs> Forty. Uh, can you you can you have it in front? What is the age of the patient? Can you go back? Yeah. Forty five. Forty five. Forty five. Okay. So no no. Can you go back please? Go back please. Forty five. Forty five. Diabetes right? No 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 no. Forty five. Not non diabetic. Non diabetic. Okay. Only so forty forty years. Only forty years. Forty years. Yeah. So his chest vascular is zero. Zero. Yes. Will you want to coagulate him? Sir, can I add something, sure. sir? Yeah. In ACM patient, there is no role of charge. No, 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 no. Don't add that. <laughs> I didn't want you to add that. Yes, yes. <laughs> sure, sure. Not, not use that. So, so the question is with a CHASVA score of zero. Zero. In patients with, Dr. Shafiq was mentioning. Please go ahead now, Dr. Shafiq. Yes. I'm Dr. Mohsin, sir. Oh, motion, motion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> motion, but motion, what do you think? So tell me about it. Uh, in atrial fibrillation with HCM, there's a role of chat bus score. 
If patient with a patient must have to anticoagulate to prevent thrombembolism. Yes, 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 yes. It's very important. They are at very high risk of very high risk of it. high risk of um, thrombobilic complications. So chest vas code does not apply in cases with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And Even most likely, thing, apical variety most likely. Another thing, Rafik Bhai, on this same way, rheumatic mitral stenosis and atrial fibrillation, the risk is so high that if you look at the all these uh, earlier trials, they all excluded those from the risk of thromboembolism. So chat mask in those patients also do not apply in a, in a atrial fibrillation with uh, with uh, rheumatic mitral valve disease. And another situation is pyrotoxicosis. These are not historically patients included. Um, for the others, a unique group is the post-op cabbage and AFib. There, people agree that you can probably apply, but there are some unique clinical situations where you, you don't need to, you actually don't apply the chat mask. Okay, so continue with Dr. Morrison, please. There are very good cases uh, today. Okay. One, um, uh, Dr. Hafiz, I, I asked the question, how is the manage the patient in the, uh, because HCM not uh, managed in Bangladesh so much. So how do you manage the patient in HCM? With, we should antibiotic first patient first, but different management for the HCM patients in your, your center. Mohsin, was there yes. any history of sudden cardiac death in the family? No, no history of sudden cardiac death. Uh, that's one point very important for these patients because they have two risks. One is the thrombobilic risk, particularly in this patient in the context of atrial fibrillation. The second is sudden cardiac death because they are also prone to uh, VF. And these two things, past this VT or VF, we have to consider taking detailed history, taking the echo findings, what is the wall thickness and what are the other complications, how the patient presents, et cetera. So uh, for the management, two things right from the get-go to identify. One is the arrhythmic risk and the one is the mechanical part. The arrhythmic risk is the question that I leave it to Rafik by, but historic paper is from Iliot, London. You can pull it paper, it's worth mentioning. You know, the family history of sudden cardiac death in the immediate family, patient has sudden cardiac death. The LV wall thickness, septal thickness more than three centimeter hypotension in exercise testing and VT on the telemonitoring. And now some people include that whether there is any implications in terms of genetic testing and which mutant, myosin avicin mutant versus troponin T, some are more malignant than the others. But these are the criteria for the uh, placement of ICD in this population. And of course, if it is a VF rest, that's a secondary, that's no question. But the mechanical part is the, yes, what I happens to the mechanical part, syncope and congestion, right? Uh, so syncope is a big issue. The myth is that the gradient does not matter because it's reducing the gradient may not necessarily reduce the syncope, it's a broad question. But the congestion, the diastolic dysfunction and, and, and heart failure is a big problem. And therefore we do everything that can regress the LVH. There is no drug as such. Some people try the ARVs, uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, and some try to avoid the dyssynchrony, uh, to induce the dyssynchrony pacemaker or give the myectomy. But another important thing, when we do the uh, myectomy or uh, abl septal ablation, you need to know how much is the MR. If there is a SAM giving the severe MR, then it's a problem. In those cases, better to go for myectomy and also uh, the mitral valve fix if needed. We had just one last week uh, and we just went for myectomy rather than this. In severe, severe cases where there is only congestion and nothing else can be done, then you think about alternative for the uh, device therapy for the uh, LV pump failure. But these are in a nutshell, the overall outline. And now you can talk about antiarrhythmics and control the rate yes. and then synchrony, yeah. Abhishek, I, I want to add something. Abhish. 
Can the, I, okay, good morning. Go ahead. The, the new guideline added the high risk of patient with sudden cardiac with apical annulism. This is new. This is, these are the new thing. Yes. Yeah. So let me tell you this apical aneurysm business because this happens with the apical variety. What happens the inter the interventricular gradient causing the apical thinning. The learning, yeah. Before the apical thinning, it is a problem. So we actually recognized this way before it came to the guidelines because that can be a big problem uh, for this. So what do you do? Do you go for resection reconstruction? Surgeons hate it. So to protect, we say ICD. I have two patients, one actually is a nurse, that this epical aneurysm and we did cardiac MR and see the thinning and that becomes a problem. And, and Ravi Bhai can highlight this, the, the EP cardiologist, when they see gadolinium enhancement and big area, they get nervous because that can be a big substrate for, for arrhythmias. Okay. Uh, have to summarize. I'm, but, can I make a comment? Yes, please do. Excuse I'm particularly me. interested. Uh, these patients have so-called diastolic heart failure or heart failure with these addiction factors. That's a big problem because whenever they uh, run or goes up upstairs, climb the stairs, they have shortness of breath. But you cannot, uh, there is no drug that is very much helpful in that. What about the role of empagliptogen or the RNA in these patients? Will that be helpful? Will that come out to be some good to them in future? Is there any yeah, study going, going on like that? Sure, I'm going to start on a few things, especially with this patient, because this patient came with atrial fibrillation. Three things that we need to deal with. One is the risk of stroke. And that's anticoagulation, no question. But if there is no proven atrial fibrillation, then there is no indication for anticoagulation in HCM. Number two is quality of life. And number three is quantity of life. Now for quality of life, this is the, of course, diastolic heart failure is an issue. The other issue is that outflow obstruction. And of course, there is always a reflex thing though. We have a technology, let's do a septal ablation and the patient is going to feel better. Before you do that, you must make an evaluation. Why is the outflow obstruction? Is it because of the muscle or is it because there is a prolonged papillary muscle that is causing mitral valve to obstruct the outflow? So let's say if there is a long papillary muscle and that is making the mitral valve obstruct the outflow and you do a septal ablation, Nothing is going to happen. So that evaluation by MRI is very, very important. Now, there is also a new drug. Actually, it has been proven to be beneficial, Mevacamten. Yes. And it is actually a works at the actin myosin level. And there is double blind randomized study proven that improves quality of life. I do not know about the mortality. No it's question. Skip the drug, sir. Already started in USA. No, it's not available in USA yet. It is yes. about to be available. About to be available. But it was this is a study in and this last year, yeah. Huh? Um, yeah, it was presented is a the mortality is not shown beneficial, but they are thinking that it's not uh, followed up enough. But mechanics get better. That that's a big improvement because that's the, the I mean people do die, but they really are very symptomatic. So that is one issue of quality of life. What I'm trying to highlight is there is a new medicine. Before you do septal ablation or all kinds of things, make sure that you do a proper evaluation. Why is the outflow obstruction? Is the patient going to benefit from it? And the third, of course, the quantity of life. And then you have to do a risk stratification. And there is definite guidelines on that. You can read it up. And all of those are history of sudden death on the patient, sudden death in the family, septum more than 30 millimeter, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And as Hafiz mentioned, drop in blood pressure during exercise. Those are the things that will go point score um, into this issue. Thank Can you. Can I make comments, sir? Yes, regarding, uh, drug, regarding drug treatment, uh, yes. beta blocker, usually beta blocker. Is there any role of beta blocker here as because the having patient atrial fibrillation uh, uh, with, with the uh, setting of ACM. Is there any role of beta blocker, sir? Okay. Question is, do we use it? Yes, we do. Is there any data that they do benefit? There is no scientific data on those. 
So we all use calcium channel blocker, beta blocker because there is diastolic dysfunction. Um, but I don't think there is any randomized study to um, show that this drug reduces mortality. But symptomatically, um, calcium channel blockers help because they are used for diastolic dysfunction. Thank you. I What's think mevacamptin is something that's going to be a game changer in this group of patients. No question about that. Professor, how do you control the heart atrial ventricle rate in case of HCM atrial fibrillation? Barapimil diltiazim or we can use the, uh, that is the amiodarone. Okay. So the question is uh, that HCM patients do not tolerate atrial fibrillation well. So you have to be treat them aggressively. Uh, depending on the age of the patient, I would probably start with sotalol first. Because uh, sort of all that, because most of these patients are young, and if we give amiodarone, we have to use it long term. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sotalol, and if sotalol doesn't work in a young patient, we actually send them for ablation of atrial fibrillation. This is one case that we send them early on than later. And then, of course, if nothing works, then amiodarone is the last drug that we can use. Mm -hmm. Sir, sir, whether sotalol can be combined with other conventional beta blockers, sir? Um, the question is whether we should combine sotalol with other beta blockers. Sotalol was initially introduced as a beta blocker. So if you can maximize the dose, that will work as a beta blocker, as good as any other beta blocker. Thank you, sir. Can, uh, emphasis, sir. Next case. Yes, more yes please. Uh, this patient also 45 years old, uh, male, hypertensive and diabetic, known case of CKD, chronic kidney disease. We are present with unconsciousness and breathlessness. On examination, pulse may be not recordable, and there is a lung base also uh, clear, but situation for 65 persons. This is 4 by 15, uh, CBG 19.8 millimeter. Uh, his ECG. Anyone comment the ECG? This is ECG. So it is the diagonal rhythm in the mistress. So we uh, immediately manage the patients that is hemorrhagic assessment, simultaneous decision, CPR, and arterial blood test care, ectopin, adrenaline. And after we do the, immediately do the temporary based matter. After TPM, you show. There is a tall peak T wave. And also the, the, there is spacing spike of QRS complex. Regular. So we did some investigations. Can you, can you go back, please? First ECG motion, please. Yes, this one. This one first ECG. This one yeah. is first ECG. Fine. This one is first. Yes, yes, yes. this one. This is the first one. Okay. Yes. This ECG is difficult because this ECG only has P waves. The next one, please. Yes. So with the history, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and this ECG, my question to the audience is, what is the first thing that you are going to think is the problem with this patient? Okay. Uh, is Anybody from the audience? Yes. yes. So Dr. Rahat said hyperkalemia. That's it. My first diagnosis is hyperkalemia on this patient. And the management of... Uh, sir, any comment? So, uh, also, as nicely said, the potassium is 7.2. There is hyperkalemia. And we keep in the calcium gluconate, glucose insulin infusion, salbutamol nebulization, sodium bicarbonate, fusamide, sodium polystyrene, and some antibiotics. After management, you see, uh, so uh, the vesicular rhythm, you know, so what is the agonal rhythm? This blood rate is less than 20 bit per minute. You know, vertical ticket is more than 100, accelerated individual rhythm is 40 to 100. Edibility rhythm is 20 to 40, and agonal is less than 20. The fellows, uh, you know, what is agonal rhythm? Very slow ventricular rhythm, less than 20. Terminal rhythm of the dying patients with proceeds, assist to death. 
bijectly wide complex and often absent HT activity, reflection of significant microlial damage and metabolic derangement. Treated similarly cardiac arrest victims like uh, cardiac arrest, and early pacing is suspicion impacts surgery is unclear. So there is, uh, what is the finding of the hyperkalemia? So mild cases, when it is uh, 5.5 to 6, tall peaked and tented T-waves and flattening the P-wave, moderate is 6 to 7, low amplitude, loss of P-wave, prolonged PR interval, widening of the PRS complex, HSM inhibition, and severe when more than 70, so bradycardia, sine wave, and PF, as this is showed, it is like a hyperkalemia when the both nodal rhythm and sine wave and PF and It is the hyperkalemia you see, the full effect of the T wave, peak T wave, P wave flattening, and PR prolongation by the RX complex. What the difference is hyperkalemia and ischemic T waves? You see, in hyperkalemia, T wave is tall and pointed and narrow based, and hyperacute T waves, T wave is tall, not pointed, and broad based. So, uh, what the diagnosis of hyperkalemia in patients of pacemaker? Typically, this change of hyperkalemia can also be seen even during pace rhythm. These changes revert to back to baseline with correction of the hyperkalemia. Sir, uh, any comments, Robic, sir, on the pacemaker uh, ECG and hyperkalemia? Robic, sir. Uh, no comment. No comment. Yes, Perfect. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sir, my this is finished, sir. Cases. Thank you, sir. Uh, our, we are waiting for the nice conference in the 17th December, Bangla Cardio, in the whole day conference. And another the IPGI cardiac conference, 2021st February. Today's two days day long program for the junior fellows. Uh, the case based discussion, clinical cardiology, ECG, ECO, CT, MRI, and intervention cardiology, also cardiac surgery. So I invited everyone, please register soon for Bangla Cardio and IPGI. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mosin. The cases were very, very good. Very interesting. Afiz, do you want to make some comments? So, um, no, I enjoyed thoroughly with I'm working, so I was a little interrupted uh, because of this uh, round and other issues. But one thing that you can, uh, those who are interested, you can so read uh, Dr. Radha Gopalan, my good friend uh, from uh, Arizona. He has a nice overview on the new drug, uh, Mevacampton which is, uh, a, a works on the myosin heavy chain. And as we know that there is a disarray in the uh, uh, myofibrils in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This drug has a potential to reduce the outflow gradient as Rovik Bhai pointed out, but it is still under the review. It has elevated to a, a drug of huge interest. So it may be approved soon probably early 2022. Um, so we are hoping for that. But otherwise, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this session. Thank you so much. Avishma, can you send that article to us? Yeah, sure, I can send you the link, yeah. yeah. It has a good summary. Yeah. Also, the paper has been, the double blind study has been published. Yes, so yes. you can download so that. He, he basically summarized those, those that trial and also the trials upcoming and give it, give his perspective. He's a heart failure guy. Jamil has been quiet today. I was learning. <laughs> no, this All was a learn. very good session. I enjoyed yes, it. Sir. Yes, sir. All the cases are very good and this uh, is testing also. Arun, do you want to make some comments? Arun Maski, are you here? I have seen him. I missed Tadiva's first half of the lecture. Oh, um, I, I just wanted to one, say one thing. And uh, uh, I am actually going to be in Bangladesh from January 3rd to 10th. Oh. And uh, I, I will be happy to come over to your institution if it is early, like 7 or 8 a.m. so that I can uh, be with you. Uh, if anyone interested, I can be there. Uh, okay. well, Azom is there. <laughs> Azom left. Mosin, have Can you heard what uh, Hafiz Bey was saying? Sure, sir. Sure. I will, will be I will be arranged. Thank you, sir. 
A case-based discussion actually give us some insight in practicality of managing a particular case. Difficult cases do not come what the books say in that particular way. And you have to think on the top and you have to make a decision which may or may not be always correct, but we try to be correct as much as is possible. So, this presentation today actually help us in reaching that goal. So, today, so for, 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 for let, I, me ask, I, let me get a free consult from Rufik Bai, but it yeah. is a very interesting case. This is, you know, we have Thanksgiving weekend and Thanksgiving early morning, three o'clock, I got a page that trauma team, we have leveled one trauma, 40 year old, hit the uh, car in an electrical pole and then got head injury and uh, intubated. And the EKG is suspicious of uh, anterior wall MI, they call cardiology. So CT head is negative. EKG, you know, I was thinking this is, that looks like real anterior wall. So, uh, but what do you do? Uh, and the patient has sustained VT1 shock. EF like, uh, less than 20%, blood gas pH 6.9, and, uh, and the bicarb is like 10, lactate is high, and they are telling me, you know, what do you want to do? And the bedside echo is severe LV. So, uh, so the, my question is this. I took the patient, of course, to the cath lab. I said uh, 6.9, you know, I break the rules that I promote. <laughs> because 6.9 is my cutoff and the patient is at 6.9, young patient. So I took this and it is interesting, the LAD is occluded uh, in the prox LAD. I opened that and the patient Glasgow coma scale was like three when he came in. Uh, and now he waking up, therapeutic hypothermia, we said we give, but then we don't need it, levofit is off and patient is fighting the vent. I said, forget about hypothermia. And then ultimately 36 hours later, patient woke up, uh, we got extubated and, and, uh, and I came back and I see that he's talking to his wife. Little bit problem um, with, the, with the orient uh, you know, his speech, maybe something. Um, I think he's going to get better. Question to Rofik Bhai, will you give ICD in this patient? <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem case for two reasons. One, yes. initial VT. Second is cardiomyopathy. So you can say, well, let's play on the safe side. Just put an ICD in and send him home. Second option will be to give a live vest and wait for three months. At the end of three months, if the LV function completely normalizes, do an electrophysiology study. Yeah. Or you can do cardiac MRI to see if there is any significant scar. If there is no scar, if it is negative, then you can say, well, um, more, most likely not. Uh, but that will be the situation. Uh, that's how I think probably we're going to manage it. Yeah, thank you, Ravikma, for the, for the consult. Any other thought? Because um, I'll tell you um, what we decided. Uh, any other thought, Dr. Muskie? No, I'm enjoying your talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ravi, I, I took a shortcut. And the important thing is, luckily, the patient's wife is a, a nurse. Mm. Uh, and she says, why give a device? Mm. And I said, there is, I, I went through the discussion, as Ravi Bhai nicely pointed out. So we, are, we both agreed to give life best an optimal med. But I'm going to do the echo before discharge. Normally I don't, but mm -hmm. I will in this case because I think some of it will be because he's so good. I think the EF will be better already because of the some of this was stunning with the shock. So yes. um, yeah. But the other option would be Hafiz. Yeah. The other option. This is probably an ideal case for sub Q ICD. Yeah. Because what you do at the end of three months, if you have any doubt put a subcutaneous ICD, the guy doesn't get any shock for three years, don't replace it or just take it out. Right, but we would opted for this. I tell you, this is a lean, keen guy. Sub-Q ICD, I don't know. You know, big. 
<laughs> and he's a male. No, I, I, I think I think that is the right plan. I mean, that is that what you did is the yeah. right plan to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting. That's why I was saying that the sustained VT in that posterior MI, it may not be all that easy. Yeah. Uh, again, the summary of the uh, Hafizda observation is that you get VF from ischemia, acute ischemia. You get VT from a scar. Old ischemia. And that's the point he's pointing out. In that or in the previous case, most in case, the old inferior mind, true uh, posterior mind, why should he have VT? He should have VF if it is related to the new ischemia. And that's the point he's saying that he's not feeling comfortable sending the patient without revascularization or without assessing for ICD. Well, yeah. the reality, economic reality says otherwise. And I was watching this Ibu request is that. We are like uh, in a Mashfiku Rohim situation, 96. If that happens, we need to call around to get four more for, for the century. The highest we got today is 96. Can <laughs> I ask one question to, understand this? to Rafiq Bhai? Yes, Sarun. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one patient, 79 years old, admitted for COVID. Develops complete heart pop, put TPI. After maybe seven days, his she has come into sinus rhythm. EF is 25 to 30 percent, triple vessel disease. So, does she need pacemaker? <laughs> <laughs> this, this gentleman has everything. Well, uh, unfortunately, the COVID and uh, Hafiz are more experienced with complete heart block. I'm not sure there is any data on that, right, Hafiz? So, Hafiz, why you are dealing with COVID? So, what would be uh, in this lady, 79 years, did MRI no scar? So, first of all, hemodynamics good, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, echo was around 25 to 30 percent, so dilated cardiomyopathy. And develop uh, so complete heart block post COVID in hospital. Seventy nine so I, years. I give an analogy that COVID itself, like there may be underlying conduction system disease, and COVID just makes it worsen. Uh, and there may be drug related, but also we are looking at our data on the remdesivir and bradycardia and all that. But it's still, I think, at the end of the day there is underlying conduction system disease and it is more uh, revealed with the COVID and the medications. So two things, we try not to do pacemaker permanent, particularly not sure what Proviva is doing, but we try to buy time as much as we can and think about a device before discharge because so many of them get better. So, but, but you have to also remember, okay, let me, let me do this. If it is my grandmother, if, if this patient was 45 year old, this patient has bought a bifi ICD. However, this patient is not 45, patient is 79. If my grandmother lived in America at the age of 79, I will not give him anything, her anything. Simple um, as that. Um, because you have to keep the age in consideration also. Um, if it were me, I would not want one personally. Um, when the patient asked me, do, do you have the technology to do it? Okay. Yes, well, I have the technology and skill to do it. And I can do it safely on you if you want it. Yeah. Yeah. I have to, if, the, if the curious complex is why during complete heart block in that case? No, Unreliable, the, yes. No. Definitely, but the question was that the, the um, differentiation between a 45-year-old, 79-year-old, and then the infection, the COVID issue, whether it COVID did it or it's just a coincidence that patient has really a disease. So those are the different issues that you have to grapple with. And the other decision, if you have to do anything, are you going to put a single chamber pacemaker, dual chamber pacemaker, all by ICD? That is the gradation that you have to make on this. One may say, look, I don't want to die suddenly from complete heart block, but I want to live. You, you can put a pacemaker in. 
or by the pacemaker. ICD at a 79, I always leave it to the patient to decide. Yeah. And you can put a temporary wire and buy a few more days and see. No, she has recovered. She has recovered? Yeah. Oh, see that? That paid off. Buying time paid off. So yeah. does she require permanent pacemaker or, or not in this age? What, what is the heart rate now and what is the chronotropic no. response? No, heart rate is around 80, 90. Chronotropic response is good. So uh, why don't we discuss that you brought up the at this age. That's the part that you have to, um, you have to tell the patient. I mean, um, age should be a consideration. For pacemaker age, we don't consider as much uh, as opposed to ICDs. Um, that is something that you have to uh, think about. Yeah, probably LIA, leave it alone for now. Yes, probably. So I search literature, they said if it's a persistent complete heart block, then go for and do pacemakers and all with transient complete heart block. Didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Arun, nice seeing you. I haven't, we haven't seen you for a, quite a period of time. But, yeah, because so. my I am not a panelist now. I, I was watching as a participant. <laughs> what do you mean by you? you what happened? Now, I don't know. This. Arun, we have to sorry, Denny, I had internet Vipu, problem. We no. make sure that Arun is always make a panelist. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I didn't. Our see. friends should not be ever missed. Sir, join with can the you, general link. Basically. Can you okay, uh, uh, on my video? Sir, your video, video. is on. No, no, I can see you. Looks nice. Video is stopped. Yeah, no, no. It is fine. I can. We can see you. No, I cannot see anybody else. Why? So, Hafiz, my one more question. Is there any progress being made on those two papers I sent you? Oh, is that good enough or not? Uh, no, I, yeah, yes, yes. I, you know, the the prop these are mainly case based. So uh, we are a little ambitious in terms of going to higher impact, but we'll we'll communicate with you soon. So I can send that uh, this uh, transit uh, complete heart block uh, following okay. this COVID also with the ECGs. Okay. And some MRI pictures okay. and angiographic pictures too. Okay. okay, let's close the session and then we can talk, right? Yeah. Uh, Athar Bhai, can you please uh, end up, uh, close the session? As an excellent session today and congratulations, Dr. Mohsin, for your brilliant presentation. Everybody enjoyed this session and we are happy, sir. Today we had got Dr. Khandukar, Professor Kamrul Islam with us, Professor M.Z. Azum. Mohammad Shofiq, Naharama Haidar, and many other panelists with us today's session. And Mohsin presented very nicely, and Mohsin proved that he is the leading teacher right now. Mohsin, congratulations you again. And Sadebhai, thank you very much for your research oriented presentation. Sadebhai, thank you very much. And today we, can, we could not make time for Hafiz Bhai. Hafiz Bhai, actually, we are waiting for your presentation in next Sunday. Hafiz Bhai, thank you very much. And thank you everybody oh, for your presentation. No, no, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm always the backup. <laughs> yeah, 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 really. We want to as a backup in next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Our really big source of knowledge. So, sir, we can conclude the session and thank you, Ribu, for yes. your excellent arrangement. Thank you, Ribu. Thank you, and, sir. Thank you. And so you can stop what? sharing with you, uh, streaming. Okay, okay. Kamal bhai, uh, live stream to off kore Sir, it has been stopped. Live off, off again.